This is Twit. Looking at these benchmarks, um, you can honestly say that even without heavily tweaked benchmarks or heavily tweaked competition or, or, or basically in, you know, blunt, honest benchmarks that, you know, this pretty much is the fastest gaming processor you can buy. Um, yes. Yes, that is, that is still uh, seems to be a true statement. Absolutely. Personally, I'm buying a $329 Ryzen 7 2700X before I'm buying a Core i9-9900K. Um, yes, which is and that is know. because of the value proposition as opposed to yeah. the ultimate performance proposition, right? Like, you know, that's a... You get a Ryzen part for significantly less money. Um, well, let's have you know, R15, single-threaded. I mean, that's where... I think it's probably one of the glory benchmarks for the 9900K, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, but again, I mean, that's Cinebench. It's not gaming, right? You've got re- to really think of... Like, I spend a lot of time your, rendering, so workload. rendering benchmarks is, is always kind of a, a big thing for me. But when you're looking at that, I mean... Well, okay. So I can't see the top of the benchmark right now. What are we looking at? Ashes of the Singularity Escalation 1080p. <laughs> Obviously not... CPU right, there's bound. Not a, yeah, there's not a huge spread there, right? Um, mm-hmm. And again, that's only running a 1080p, but granted, it's Ashes, which is, you know, it's kind of a, a decently heavy workload where even a 1080p, right. the GPU is still doing a, a decent amount of work there uh, to the point where it kind of diminishes uh, the spread that you see on the CPU side. That's just mm-hmm. that's just generally how benchmarks in general work, right? There's usually a, a bottleneck someplace, depending on whatever the workload is. Uh and sometimes you're kind of right on the fine line there. like, And that's very much the case in just modern systems where sometimes the bottleneck for one given uh, given game might be the CPU, whereas you might fire up mm-hmm. a different game or just slightly different settings and the bottleneck might shift over to the GPU where you might see a, you know, and then suddenly the CPU doesn't matter as much, right? And then it's really right. down to the point of, you know, does it get the job done reasonably quickly? And if so, performance will be just fine, right? Um but that said, I mean, just generally speaking across CPUs, like CPUs usually, you know, do okay. Like it's, it's, a CPU is not some, some super critical thing uh, right. in modern day games where, you know, it's just, it's a game. It's trying to render things to the display. It makes more sense that the, the workload would be a little bit heavier on the GPU side anyway. Um, but there are some cases like right there where it's what's scrolling by and Civ. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, that game seems to be leaning a little more on the CPU, right? Um, mm-hmm. And then you do see a spread. And in that case, uh, that 9900K is, is just is able to dominate the field, right? Um, right. But, you know, but uh, it is it is a spread there. Like, it's, you can't really argue that it's not a huge difference when, uh, you know, that 2700X, you're, you're talking like, what is that, like 15... Uh, almost tw- actually, it's like a twenty percent reduction. Yeah, when you drop down to that that part. But again, that's only if you're after that one particular workload slash game, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you're more on a budget, that that part could you know still be for you and can still get the job done, right? Um, so do things change as you as you move out of 1080p performance, or did you guys kind of avoid looking at you know 4K performance? I guess there probably wasn't much point. You wouldn't be. Oh yeah, at that I mean, point, as you as you shift, GPU. yeah, as you shift up there, the the perform the the delta pretty much evaporates on the CPU mm-hmm. side. Um, when you get into if you get all the way up to 4K resolutions, um, I'm not sure if uh, Ken did uh, 1440p in this particular piece or not, or just decided to focus on 1080p. I think for time. Uh, time considerations. He stuck with the 1080p. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we will also show the next rung up on resolution to kind of give an idea of what the, you know where where is the point where that bottleneck shifts. Um, but probably safe to say that you know once you had 1440p or above in in modern titles, you, you know as long as your uh, as long as your frame rates are still going to be sticking somewhere around 60, mm-hmm. uh, you know then uh, again. CPUs kind of become a wash. Um, so let's see. Uh, there was an iometer test. Actually, I was I worked with Ken briefly on this one to just uh, mm-hmm. we're trying to show like is there a way to see what change happens due to this whole Spectre and Meltdown thing because Spectre and Meltdown affects storage related performance pretty heavily, 
Um, right. Especially like random access and whatnot. And we were trying to figure out, well, there's supposed to be some changes and some variants of Spectre and Meltdown or mitigated and hardware on on this revision versus on you know previous uh, previous Intel CPUs. Like, what can we do? And I was, and I just thought to myself, well, you could just run something like Iometer on a RAM disk. Just run it on something where you know that the limit is not really, you know, you want the CPU to be the bottleneck. And uh, mm -hmm. I just know from personal experience using tools like Iometer that there's actually a case where uh, a single thread can only do so many random operations per second, uh, you know, at such a high rate before the storage is no longer the bottleneck and now the CPU is. So same story as before where we're talking about the bottleneck being a CPU or GPU for a game. For storage performance, it's either the storage or the CPU, depending on you know what you're doing and what kind of workload it is. So we set up a workload that was going to go after uh, sort of to, to evaluate the CPU's ability to handle storage in, in a given version of Windows and with the given state of the Spectre and Meltdown landscape. Um, and looking at those results, so we were testing reads and writes because the Spectre Meltdown stuff impacts reads and writes differently. Um, there were some things that were surprising to me because uh, our standard storage test bed uh, is still like this X99 system that was reasonably beefy at the time, like the CPU is overclocked. And we try to, when we do our storage testing, we don't want the CPU to be the bottleneck, right? Um, mm -hmm. Back when I was tuning that system and setting up all those workloads, uh, the, the maximum IOPS that a single thread could hit on that particular system, again, like high-end system, but a few years back, the, it would saturate at like 200,000, 220,000, something like that. Uh, right. And now we have like modern processors like 9900K, they're doing almost, well, a little bit under and a little bit over 400,000. So like storage performance is nearly doubled in, in relation to how quickly can the system turn that that request around um how quickly can it get through all the different steps that a request for information has to go through through the whole kernel and you know and all those links in the chain it has to make you know make it through all the layers out to the device and then back right um so just an interesting tidbit there um also interesting is uh that there is kind of a penalty that the ryzen slash threadripper cpus see uh Probably, it's not necessarily because of optimizations or just how modern they are. It's really just because there's extra latency penalties related with the way that things have to, the way that, uh, you know, information has to transit between the RAM and the cores on those on those platforms. Uh, this is, you know, that infinity fabric latency related thing that we're always talking about when we, when we deal with the AMD side. Um, so it's kind of just a limitation of the architecture. And you can actually, I know Ken did do testing there, but like, if you were to do things like overclock the memory further on the Threadripper systems or on the AMD systems, you might actually bring those numbers higher. Um, you know, it's just it, the bottleneck sort of becomes the the fabric within the CPU and whatnot. It anyway, seems like um, you know all that all that stuff aside, uh, it really comes down to you know if you want if you want the fastest thing, right? Uh, this is kind of your bet, but you're going to have to pay for it. Right, uh, the price is supposed mm -hmm. to be around five hundred dollars, but so far yeah, we've only seen it. We've only seen it for like what five eighty. Yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely don't buy one right this moment. Even if you're interested in it, it's probably worth waiting a few weeks to, for hopefully that price to become a little bit more sane. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but and, and, well, and the other thing is like, while most of the people who are listening to this podcast would probably automatically buy an aftermarket air cooler or an aftermarket liquid cooler. Um, it's, you know, you're talking like right now, 580, maybe it'll be down to 530. You're absolutely going to have to buy an aftermarket cooler for this. There's no cooler in the box on this one. Um, right. I also, I mean, looking at the benchmarks, it seems like anything you're doing that's got a ton of IO is going to have an advantage running under the, the 9900K, um, you know, like workstation type stuff or content creation type stuff. Um, you know, which for me is like the the whole focus of this has been gaming, um, but you know, there's there's some pretty impressive you know performance attributes to this that are not just straight you know four threads or smaller uh, CPU abuse, um, right? Which is pretty impressive. Yeah. So 
you know, the best thing I could suggest to you is just, you know, look at your budget. This is just the, your general, like, CPU buying advice. They'll like, look at your budget. Right. How much do you want to spend? What's your use cases? What kinds of things are you going to do with the system? And then go through a review like Ken's or anybody else for that matter. If you don't, you know, don't, don't always just look at one review, but you should probably look at several to get the, the bigger picture. Um, mm -hmm. And once you've, you know, look, look for the particular benchmarks that are going to be close to the kinds of things you see yourself doing with it. And okay, which thing looks like the best thing?